Hello and welcome to Back of the Net and Beyond. And today I'm going to be speaking to current professional footballer James Coppinger, who plays with Doncaster Rovers. How are you doing, mate? You okay? Yeah, good. Thanks. You? Yeah, all good. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming on. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, I mean, how's life at the minute for yourself? Uh, good. Yeah. Um, obviously, with with lockdown, things have been a little bit different. Um, I've got three kids, two boys, 12 and 13, and my daughter's six. So homeschooling, um, which isn't always easy when you're a professional footballer. No, I, no, I 100% agree, mate. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, I retired kind of seven years ago and I've got two kids myself and no one predicted the, the pandemic and obviously the situation that we're in at the moment and homeschooling and things. So I, I know exactly where you're coming from with regards to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, in terms of the show, um, obviously for the listeners out there and kind of anyone that's not really listened to any of my podcasts in the past, um, mainly for me, uh, the reason for doing a podcast is to get people on like yourself, athletes, former athletes, figures within sport, um, and just make everyone aware how kind of uh, athletes operate and the transferable skills that they've got, which suits other industries and, and uh, organizations, which... Uh, in a way, I don't think the information is readily available um, from an athlete's perspective and also kind of uh, an organisation organization's perspective as well. Um, so, yeah, once again, thanks for coming on. Um, obviously, just, just let everyone know kind of what you're doing at the moment with yourself. Obviously, you're still playing for, for Doncaster and it seems like you've been playing for many, many years. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're the same age. Uh, you're slightly, I think you're about six months older than me, uh, but the same age group, same year group. And you're still playing, so I mean that that's amazing in itself. But yeah, just let everyone know kind of uh, what, what you're doing at the moment. Yeah, so like you said, I've been at Doncaster 16 seasons now. Um, just signed a new contract that will take me into my final season. I've, I've sort of announced that this will be my final year in professional football. Um, I, th I think I think the timing's perfect. I always wanted to play um, to 40 and sort of have my kids sort of watching me and, and coming to the games and um yeah it's a real sort of um a thing that i'm proud of um but i feel like i've been fortunate with injury so i've played 40 plus games every season for the past 18 seasons um and I feel like that's why I'm still playing. My body's conditioned and I feel like I offer something every season, regardless of my age. I think 36 and 37, um, I got player of the season uh, both years. I got over 10 goals, most assists in the division, player of the season, uh, voted PFA team, team of the year, 36, 37. And I think every year sort of I've sort of pushed myself because once you reach 35 you get to a stage where it's, it's one year contracts so for me it's trying to justify my worth in the team regardless of being at a club that long I don't want to be part of the furniture and just being given a contract mm. for the sake of being given a contract so uh, my motivation every season is to prove my worth which is, is, is still being good stead um, like you say I, I got one based on what I offered last season, um, most assists in the team, most key passes in the division last year. Um, so I'd like to think that my contract this year for next year is warranted. 100%, mate. I mean, I'll be honest, I know what it's like to obviously, to even obviously make it as a professional footballer and sustain a career. And I knew about you from, from kind of when I was 16, 17 and indirectly followed your career. We obviously play similar positions. So naturally I've got kind of an affiliation with, kind of you on the pitch and how hard it is to obviously play on the wings and uh, I know sometimes you play kind of other positions as well but primarily you're, you're a winger um, I mean how does it feel because you're obviously 39 now obviously really fit um, and obviously you offer a lot season in season out uh, on and off the pitch to whoever you're playing for um, and obviously you're at Doncaster at the moment which is probably where well, you've obviously played most of your career there and you've amassed nearly 700 games uh, obviously, you said you're 39 now. So, I mean, that's some achievement. How, how does that make you feel? Because obviously, again, the older you get, the harder it is, as you mentioned, to get contracts and you have to justify kind of the reason why you're getting one. And not only to the fans and, and the management, uh, but also your teammates as well. 
Yeah, definitely. And, and I think adaptability, I talk about it recently. You have to be able to adapt to managers, coaches, positions, um, circumstances. And, and I think I've been able to do that. I've had, eight, I've had eight managers while I've been at Doncaster and I've been able to, and probably three or four in the last five years. So I've had to obviously change the perception of of their sort of mindset in terms of a lad who's 36, 37, 38, uh, yeah. what, what can he do? And Darren Ferguson, Grant McCann, Darren Moore, uh, Paul Dickoff, all, all four managers have sort of, um, I've not won round, but I've, I've challenged them as they've challenged me. So I do, I do really um, enjoy the motivation of proving people wrong. I've done it all my life since I was a kid, been told I was too small to to be in academies. I was never in an academy. I never wanted to be a professional footballer. So really, uh, yeah. So at 17, I signed for Newcastle um, for 1.2 million, and at 16, I was playing Sunday League. Um, and then in 19, I made my Premier League debut. So Bobby Robson gave me my Premier League debut. Um, and then at, at 20, I was relegated out of the Football League. Um, so there's there's so much that, that has happened to me or happened to me in a short space of time, um, which is why, obviously, going on to, to what I'm doing now, um, I formed a company, Pro Mindset, uh, working on the mental side of, of the game, basically, because... In the 23 years that I've been playing, it's the biggest standout component um, in professional football. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many players fail <clears throat> due to, not due to the lack of ability or physical ability, um, down to their mental um, strength, their mental capacity, their mindset. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of players that have had the most ability, um, but just can't, can't for some reason understand um, how to deal with setbacks, disappointments, uh, people not liking them, um, injuries. Uh, there's so much, so many I can count uh, forever. But um, it's one of the reasons why, like you say, I'm I'm trying to help other players. That's massive, mate. And I want to touch on that in more detail a bit later because I have obviously uh, kind of done a bit of research on on what you're doing at the moment, um, aside from playing football. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of your debut, because you mentioned that you didn't go through. Uh, like the academy system or the, or the YTS system as it would have been back in the day. Um, and I, I actually did. And I've spoken to many players before. Cause I'm 5'7", I'm, I'm so I'm kind of the same height and build as yourself. But as a player, when I was growing up, I never heard anyone kind of say to me, oh, like, you're too small. Um, and it, it annoys me when I hear players obviously talking about things like that, just because at a young age, you don't want to be hearing that. And obviously, as a coach, I always think if, if I'm going to be a coach, I want to I want to draw on the the good points of, of any player and utilize those and help the player grow. So it just it's a bit dismissive from that perspective. And again, that that's another part of football or sport in general where you need a bit of a thick skin. And obviously, you've mentioned kind of you come through that and you've gone through the highs and lows throughout your career. So it shows you've got that side of like resilience, so to speak. But you went from the league, you said. At kind of 15, 16, and you sign for Newcastle. So that's a massive step up, even if it was just a case of training with the youth team. But how did you find that? The transition from, I don't know, playing for whoever you were playing for, and then going to Newcastle, being amongst kind of Newcastle first teamers, youth team players, and the facilities and everything else? Yeah, it was. Um... It was unbelievable, to be honest, how it came about. I mean, like I say, I played Sunday League for Martin Juniors, who uh, the likes of Jonathan Woodgate, Graham Lee, um, Stuart Downing, a lot of players from Middlesbrough played played at that sort of uh, for that team. Um, I then played one season with with my friends, got player of the season, mm. uh, top goal scorer, and then Darlington um, saw me and offered me a two year YTS. Um, sort of three months into that YTS, I represented England. I went down to Lillyshaw uh, for a trial. I got picked. Um, went to Poland, uh, went to the European Championships as well. Um, and then Newcastle signed me. I mean, I went in one day with the YTs in February on deadline day um, and the manager called me up to his office. Um, I thought I'd done something wrong. I didn't have a clue what was happening. And then he told me that my dad was coming with a suit and we were travelling up to St. James's Park. Um, really? Yeah, ironically, they'd 
I'd been up there for a trial, this is probably six, eight months previous, and they'd, they'd obviously uh, rejected me. Okay. Um, and then I was going up there traveling, me and my mum and my dad um, went to St. James's Park and obviously negotiated a contract and assigned. Um, so one day I was training with the YTs, the next day I was training with Kenny Daglishi and Rush, John Barnes, Alan Shearer, uh, wow. players, Stuart, Stuart Pierce, players that I'd looked up to and um, envied for years and years um yeah. and like you say it was it was unbelievable it was it was something i look back on now and i was never i was never mentally prepared for that i mean um obviously we'll go into a lot later on but i never believed i should have been there for four years i was there um yeah. and ironically i made i made a premier league appearance under sir bobby robson Mm. Based on my my based on my ability alone, nothing to do with anything else. Um, like you say, I was always told I was too small when I was a kid at school. I couldn't get in the county team because I was too small. Uh, Middlesbrough wouldn't sign me because I was too small. So, like you said, I was constantly getting told um, mm. he can come and train with us, or he just needs to grow a bit. And um, it just again, my dad never pushed me. My dad was never one of these people who. I remember going to Blackpool and standing on the sidelines for the whole game whilst um, been at Middlesbrough or trialling for Middlesbrough. And my, I said, look, Dad, I'm not doing that again. And my dad went and spoke to one of the, the coaches and he said, look, James doesn't want to come again. He went, what do you mean? He says, well, he's not going to stand on the sideline and watch. He went, well, people give their right arm to do that. And he said, well, James isn't going to do that. Yeah. So I never went, I never went back there. And um, like you say, I, I always wanted to enjoy, I love playing football. That's why I'm playing at 39. Mm. I absolutely love what I do. I wake up every morning and I absolutely love training. I love playing games. I love playing with my kids. I've been playing on the pitch, heads and volleys uh, this afternoon. I've been doing some running and we've been playing heads and volleys. I absolutely love it. And that's why I do what I do. I don't do it yeah. for, my motivation isn't money. It's never been money. It's always been because I love what I do. I know that sounds corny. And when I say it, I think, well, wow, people must think I'm, Stupid or <laughs> joking. <laughs> you're, just, you're just being honest at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I think it backs up why I'm still playing. Um, yeah. I think a lot of players fall out of love with the game. They maybe play for a certain amount of money and they don't want to take it. The money doesn't justify playing football. Uh, yeah. For me, do you know what I mean? I, I, I play for free if I, if, if, if I had to. And I probably will end up playing for free um, because I, I do really enjoy it. Over the 12, 13 weeks that that I've been off. Um, I, as soon as I went back and started kicking a ball, I just get that feeling, you know. Mm -hmm. It just, it just, it, it's something that I've done all my life, and it makes yeah. me feel really, really happy. So mm. that's massive, mate. I, di I, I digressed a bit there. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, I, to be honest, sometimes I just like to let people just tell their story, and like I said off air, you can you can take it where you want because most people. They've got a perception of athletes, especially footballers, as you know, and most of the time it's not true. So, again, it's, it's another reason why I'm doing the podcast to get people to see a different side to footballers or, or kind of athletes in general. Um, you mentioned when you were at Newcastle, you made um, your appearance, you, you debut under uh, Bobby Robson in the Premiership at, at that time of the call. So, how was that feeling for you? Obviously, knowing that you've been through a lot beforehand in terms of too small, you need to grow a bit and train with us and whatever else to then make your premiership debut you must have been yeah, happy it was, yeah it was uh, rude hullet came in so sir, sir kenny daglish signed me um and then rude hullet came in i went uh, traveling with the first team pre-season uh, played in some pre-season games uh, with alan shearer scored some goals did really really well mm. and then he got the sack um sir bobby came in put all the reserves on the transfer list um, including myself I went out on loan to Hartlepool did really really well came back and yeah I got the opportunity to make my debut um, at home partnering Alan Shearer up front um, against Tottenham and it was unbelievable like you say it was one of them moments that I probably took for granted like everything at, at that time yeah. um, and like I said previous I was never mentally prepared for that I thought once I'd made my debut that was it I'd, I'd cracked it and Mm. sort of stopped doing all the things that had got me to that point really um and and that's why I'm so passionate about what I want what I'm going into in terms of trying to mentor other players um trying to pass on my knowledge 
um, because I feel like at that point I had no support on network. I had nobody around me that really cared, not really cared. And, and that doesn't sound because my mum and dad had divorced. My mum and dad were going through their own sort of issues. Um, yeah. None of my family had ever been in that situation before. My granddad had just been diagnosed with cancer. Um, a lot of things were going on off the pitch that, that were totally out of my control, but um, yeah. that people don't see, you know, people just see what's going on on the pitch and what, what you're doing day to day. I feel like mentoring players and, and offering players that um, experience and that different way of thinking and a different outlook on things um, can really help, I think. Brilliant. I uh, 100% agree with what you're saying there. Um, and I've said this before, kind of speaking to people on and off air. And I said, normally when you're, we always draw on football, because obviously I've played, you've played, and most of the people I speak to on the podcast is, is generally footballers. Um, so I, I always say, when you sign for a club or before you sign, naturally you have a physical medical and they check your, I don't know, I don't know, balance and whatever else, your agility and your speed and kind of you're on the treadmill and you're doing this and that and you're stretching fine but I think going forward maybe the next five or ten years as well as doing a physical um, kind of um, a physical test they're going to be I think they're going to start implementing some type of not a mental test but another side of it another facet to it, another strand to it whereby they, they kind of check your mental state your mental well-being as well because there's more information that's readily available nowadays. I mean, going back when we kind of made our debut, 99, 2000, um, it wasn't really prevalent, kind of mental health issues and um, kind of, it was always kind of locked away. People would suppress their feelings and things. And now people are more readily open to come out. And the more high profile, profile people come out as athletes, uh, the more kind of, uh, kind of, the more people who aren't kind of high profile um, household names will come out as well. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. No, I agree. I think I put an article on, I think it was today actually, Graham Potter, the Brighton managers sort of looking at players' mentality rather than just experience now when he's signing new players for next summer. Yeah. And I think I think the best managers are going um, gonna to do that. I've been speaking to clubs uh, Premier League clubs uh, with regards to what I'm doing with regards to mindset and the best clubs are the ones that it's at the forefront of everything they do mm. um, they're starting to understand that there's so much you can do to enhance your performance to help players uh, day to day um, and it's huge it, it's for me it's like I said 23 years it's the biggest thing that stands out for me um, there's so many different things you have to take on board as a professional footballer. Like what you're saying about transferable skills. That's why I feel like if you have a career in professional football, there's so many things that you can take from that because there's so much expected from you. Um, you're in a, a high pressure industry that's expecting results, expecting performances, expecting so much every single day. And yeah. you have to deliver. Um, and it's the same in business. I've trans transitioned into into buying companies, um, and I've been doing that for two years. And I've been around entrepreneurs and business owners, and I don't feel out of place because <clears throat> because I've been in that environment, even even worse than that environment. Um, so I know exactly what you're saying, and I feel like mentality and the way people think and deal with certain circumstances and situations will have a huge bearing on what managers um, or which players managers sign. Definitely. Um, and like from a, from a fan's perspective, just leading on from kind of what you were just saying, a, a fan will naturally think, well, okay, he or she's on the pitch, they're fit. And invariably, most players aren't 100% fit kind of any time throughout their career. Uh, even like the likes of me and you who are really lucky with injuries and stuff, as soon as you're on the pitch, everyone just thinks, as a, as a fan, he's fit or she's fit. And sometimes bad performances come from things that are external. Like, I mean, simple example recently would be the Jesse Lingard situation. Now, I don't know, when he was kind of going through that bad patch, kind of most, most of the season to a certain degree, no one really knew as a fan or even kind of a spectator on TV or whatever it may be. Um, we, we never really knew about his family situation until he recently came out and told everyone. And then you can kind of think, oh, well, actually, that makes sense. Now, me personally, it doesn't surprise me. But 
to the average fan, they're probably just thinking, well, he's on all this money, he should be happy to play for Man United and he should be playing well every week and why isn't he playing well anymore and he doesn't care anymore and he's got his clothes line and all that. And it, it's, it's nothing to do with that. It's just human beings at the end of the day. And normally if everything's okay off the pitch from a financial perspective, family perspective, health and well-being, invariably that will transfer onto the pitch nine times out of ten. Um, sometimes it doesn't. But if there are external factors, you're naturally going to have a Sometimes as a player, you're looking for on the top. So I can kind of release all my frustrations and forget about those things that are externally kind of not going well for me uh, for that 90 minute period. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work like that. So I think right from kind of respect. I think that's going to be a massive factor going forward in the future in sport anyway, especially football. Yeah, I, I don't think people care um, whether whether I've got my mum and dad have divorced or uh, my granddad's passed away. To an extent, I don't mean they don't care that that's happened, but they 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 look at my performance and that's what they judge me on, mm. um, and that's the ruthlessness of <clears throat> professional sport, professional football. Mm. And people I'll have a little bit of sympathy, but that's why I feel like <clears throat> it's so important to to get your mindset right is. Mm. It's so important to understand that that you're creating you're creating it anyway. This is what this is where I'm going with it. You're creating it. Um, you're creating it unconsciously. So why not take control of it? Why not understand how to improve it? Why not understand how to be better at dealing with certain things and helping others in certain situations? Um, yeah. And that's 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 the way I'm going with it. it. It's not something to be scared of. It's not something that people don't do. It's it's mm -hmm. a must if you want to be successful. Hundred percent true. Um, and as we mentioned at the top of the uh, top of the show, you're, covering, you're still currently playing. Obviously, you're 39. You've been playing for many, many years now, and primarily at Doncaster. Um, so well done for that massive achievement. Um, but I've noticed that obviously you've taken steps towards um, transitioning away from uh, football. And obviously, you mentioned you wanted to play until 40, and you've obviously potentially you're going to be achieving that going forward, all being well. Um, you just want to let everyone know kind of what you're doing in terms of uh, transitioning away from sport. You mentioned that you've kind of started a company whereby it's kind of dealing with players from a mental perspective. Yeah, so four years ago, I started a company called Pro Mindset. Um, like you say, working with players. Um, we, had, we did workshops and worked with individual players. Again, talking and un explaining um basically what it was uh and how important the mental side of the game is like i said i repeat myself a lot but 23 years it's it's the biggest and most important factor in in my career mm. um, and a lot of careers that i've seen so working with players and making them understand how important it is what they can do to improve it and get better um and it's not something weird and wonderful that people sort of um attach it to there's a huge stigma attached to psychology uh, mental health things like that uh, the mental side of the game as you will see over the next five ten years will just take off i think um i think that with social media with the expectancy of performance with money with all the things that are coming into the game getting bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. there's gonna there's gonna there's gonna be a need for huge support for players um, and that's why for me personally this last 12 13 14 weeks on zoom on calls like this has allowed me to understand you know what taking pro mindset to the next level and offering a mentorship program of mentorship programs for academy players uh, right. to help support them because for me if you're leaving school at 16 you, you're basically leaving school and going into the the big wide world yeah. But then if you're going into football as well, it's a double whammy. It's You've been thrust into this environment that you know nothing about. Um, yeah. And off you go, sink or swim. And I don't feel that's fair. Um, I feel like there should be... And I know there is support. I'm not saying there's no support. But depending on which club you go to, depends on how strong that support is. Mm. Whereas I feel like there should be constant support somebody there for you on a on a on a fortnightly monthly basis where they can actually um, help you through your process um, because i believe that you can 
you've got 16 months, 16 to 18 months to determine whether you're going to get a professional contract or not. Yeah. And in, and in that time, you have to prove yourself. And I think a lot of it comes down to how you think. Mm. 100%. And do you want to just let us know how, how that actually works then? So are you working with, I know you said you've got kind of a program for academy players and things. Would it be like a one-to-one -one session or a group session or a bit of both? Yeah, so for me, um, speaking to clubs now, it's it's about offering them a presentation. Mm. So present presenting my journey, what sort of I went through, uh, pre-framing certain things, and then showing them um, how to how to improve your your mindset, your mentality, um, yeah. strat strategizing, putting little things into your makeup to allow you to be a, to be a better player, basically. Um, okay. And I think, I think it's huge. I think, like you say, for me personally, for any individual to work with different clubs and different players, you would have to go all around the country to to have one to ones with players. Whereas, off the back of that presentation, um, clubs can then pick or allow certain players to to work with myself via Zoom, um, over the phone, and build the build relationships, build sort of a rapport, and start to work over the season. Um, to build this this professional mindset, I think it's huge. Mm. Um, again, you work on technical, tactical, physical, but who works on your mental game? Who who who's actually supporting you um, and improving your mental capacity? Mm. That's great. I mean, I think that's a great service that you're offering. Um, just because when I was a player, especially, well, I'd say throughout my career, because I'm still, I mean, it's in my psyche just to be kind of strong-willed and. Uh, kind of resilient and all the usual things but again stubborn don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing sometimes it's a bad thing because I'm stuck in my way sometimes and I just want to go my own way um, but that's just me and that's my nature so when when I was playing in clubs I, I was never although everyone's got issues kind of on and off the pitch whatever it may be but I just used to I didn't really harbour any negative thoughts um, when I was playing or when I was kind of I know, off the pitch, getting ready in the dressing rooms and whatever else. Um, but I know players that were struggling. Um, and it wasn't really, I mean, I never, I couldn't really relate to anyone who had, say, mental health issues. I was never negative towards them or anything. But um, I just, I, because I had no physical experience, I couldn't relate to what they were going through. Um, and I never really had any physical contact with kind of anyone that did. No one really came to me and asked for any for any for it. Uh, any advice or anything like that but after leaving certain clubs you hear stories about okay well this person's actually struggling and then I draw back on kind of my experiences with those players and think well were they struggling when I was actually at the club um, and as you know sometimes people will mask certain things so the loudest one in the room isn't always the most confident and things like that um, so would you encourage as part of your kind of service or in general would you encourage even players who haven't got mental health issues to go through the program because surely it's, it, it would help them. Yeah. It's not about mental health. It's not about people that have mental health issues. It's about yeah. people who want to get better as a professional footballer who want to improve their performance. So the mental is, it might've been construed a little bit there. It, it's, it's about, it's not about mental health. It's about mental performance. So it's about improving improving um, your resilience, it's about improving your focus, it's about improving your professionalism, your leadership, all these things that I, I think underpin your technical, your tactical, um, your physical, and, and that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. But I know what you're saying. I think the way you've been conditioned growing up um, will be, from your, for your case, what you just said, will, you, you don't have any of them thoughts or you, you've been conditioned, I don't know how you were brought up or, or in what sort of environment. Mm. Um, but I was, I was brought up in a small town, um, a, like a bubble, a small town mentality. Um, yeah. Always believed that I could never achieve anything. Um, right. It was always like people on the telly were this, this aliens that you would never get to. Yeah. Um, and once I got there, I didn't know how, I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to deal with this. Um, so mental health is a part of, of it. I talk about inner conflict. So if you have any inner conflict, which is similar to mental health, um, it's about getting rid of that. It's about understanding what it is. Um, I had inner conflict before I, I sort of 
my granddad passing away, I never dealt with that. My mum and dad divorcing, never dealt with that. Mm. Um, as soon as I dealt, as soon as I dealt with that, I could then start working on improving my performance, um, which is which is huge. But I don't want that stigma that's attached to mental health to prevent people from understanding more about um, the mentality uh, yeah. side of it. Because you see it all the time. I've put a lot of things on recently, just. Over the last sort of week, every time I look on the telly, players, managers, coaches are talking about mentality. Mm. But people don't know what it is. Yeah. That's, that's what that's, that's the thing. It's like, the, all right, you need to have a strong mentality. Right, what is it? Mm. That's and true. It's, like, it's easy to say. And, and I 100% agree again with what you said because everyone says, okay, well, you need mentality. Okay, you need resilience. You need to be this and that. And it's like, okay, so then ask the question. So what is mentality what what do you mean by it and i don't think many people can answer it to be honest um, you know so what you can... yeah be sorry because you the, the technical and technical and tactical you go out and you can see it you can see it with your eyes and, and the physical you're in the gym you're getting bigger you get stronger but yeah. the mental you can't physically see it so i think people struggle with that because it's it's almost like they mm. don't see any change but i'm telling you now from where i was until i met somebody and started doing this mm. and it's been a 15 16 year progression and it's the the single most reason uh, the single reason why i'm still playing now yeah. is my mentality okay. um i think if you just if you'd have gone back and i've spoke to people that have seen me at 20 and then seen me at 21 22 23 they wouldn't believe that i'm the same person mm. Um, and it's all about me changing my mindset and thinking in a different way. I, I think um, a lot of people, like what you said there, it's just the way I am. But I feel like it's because you probably don't know, not you, but people don't know that they can change. Mm. I, I wasn't aware that I could change the way I think to get a different result. Um, yeah. And as soon as I was, as soon as I understood that, I was like, oh my God, this mm. is amazing. So it's not just the way I am. It's not just me being me. Um, I can actually change this by changing the way I think to change what I do to get a different result. And it was, it was, it was a, a light bulb moment for me. Mm. And that's massive. So, and again, so we always talk about players and obviously getting into their psyche and uh, I think what you're doing is great in terms of kind of helping them from a mental perspective uh, in terms of enhancing their performance as a byproduct of uh, going through your program. Um, what about managers? Because, okay, I'm going to go slightly off piece, but in terms of, like, say, schooling, so in schools you've got, say, 30 kids in a class, you've got one teacher, and that teacher knows how to teach in one way. Not all those kids will learn in the same way, so you're going to get the naughty kid on the side who's probably actually a bright kid, probably knows it and knows what the teacher's saying, but it's a bit easy for him or her, so he's going to be a bit naughty or whatever. Um, and then you've got the kid who's probably a bit shy and maybe not come out and say anything, may not put their hand up and ask questions. So all those kids are learning in a different way, but the teacher's teaching in one, one way. So they're not all going to get the same level of understanding or the same kind of um, attention from the teacher. And sometimes, as you know, teachers can be a bit dismissive. So I think some managers are like that as well. I've come across many different managers who like, manage in a different way. Um, would you say like a program like what you've got is also kind of maybe not needed, but could be geared towards helping managers as well 100 percent, and you're absolutely spot on because i've had this feedback over the last sort of two three years in terms of <clears throat> what i'm doing um coaches should be be taught um what to look for in certain players how to communicate with players the biggest thing communication is is always brought up um you look at jürgen klopp and he's the best at it it's no coincidence that that liverpool um pep at Man City, they're the, the two sort of um, up at the top and, and, and winning what they're winning and creating um, teams like they're creating because you've got two, two of the best communicators uh, in football. Mm. And you're right, I think, I think, I genuinely think it's changing. I genuinely think that to be a coach and a manager at a top level now or at any level, you need to be able to communicate with your players mm. in a better way than it used to be when me and you sort of started. Um, you just can't get away with that anymore. Players, yeah. uh, things have changed, and there's so so much information out there now um, that players can get hold of, and they can go and seek other people. 
Um, so as a, as, a, as a manager and a coach now, you need to find ways. That's why I'm talking about Graham Potter and people like that, that yeah. they want to find the, the, next, the next thing that's going to make their team better instead of sticking to what they've been told to do yeah. or who are conditioned to think. Um, so it, it's huge. I think, you, I think you're right. Um, and I think for me personally, the mentorship programs, they're not one shoe fits all. They're individualized to the individual. They're right. sitting, sitting down and talking to the individual. How are you doing? Um, what's your background? Speaking about how they've been conditioned. Um, what do you want out of, out of the next two years? How are we going to get there? Um, and every single one is going to be different because I talk about my map. So how you were brought up, how you were conditioned plays a huge part in what you do in your life, what you think is important what other people think is important. Um, and not one, not one person is the same. I mean, you, you, you have similar sort of things in common with other people because like I have things in common with my friends because we were brought up in the same environment. Yeah. Um, but it's huge. It's absolutely massive. And like, you're right. People need to understand that people learn in different ways. Um, but I think there's so much out there now. People are cutting on to it and becoming really, yeah. really educated on it. Yeah. I'm glad. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that your mentoring program kind of it's it's tailored towards the player because no two players are the same. Uh, whether it be on the pitch or off the pitch, and so many of these kind of things that come out in the past, they're kind of generic, and it's like, right, this is what we've got, and it's for everyone, and it, it's yeah. it's too broad a scope. Um, everyone's different. You've got like yourself. You come from a small town, okay, and your mindset is naturally harboring the thoughts of the, the small town that you came from as in this is just a small town nothing happens here no one makes it into anything here and you're just looking at people on tv thinking wow they're amazing but that's not me and i've been told i'm never going to get to that level so naturally it's going to be in your psyche okay but then you've got someone who maybe comes from london inner city london hustle and bustle have got the kind of I hate using the word swagger, so I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I, I hate it. Biggest bugbear. But they've got that kind of, um, I don't know, they're more streetwise to a certain degree. They're, they're all more open. Um, they're going to learn and they're going to obviously have a different experience and outlook on things to, to yourself, in, invariably, nine times out of ten. So it's good that you kind of, you obviously speak to these players, understand their upbringing, where they're coming from, a family background and things like that, and obviously get to know them on the pitch and then you can tailor something towards their needs. 100% again. And I, ironically, I um, went for an England trial at 16, like I said, and I went to Lillyshaw and my roommate was Paul Koncheski. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, here's me from Gisborough, the smallest town on the planet, and Paul Koncheski from London, who again has the swagger and the confidence and um, and it was just unbelievable. It was, mm. I couldn't believe it. The likes of Joe Cole, uh, Danny Webber, you had Webbs on the other day. Um, yeah. So they were at Lillyshaw School and just looking at these players from Manchester, Liverpool, Ian Armstrong, um, Michael Carrick from Newcastle. Um, it was just, I was out my depth that like you can't imagine. And mm. I, was, I was there because of my ability, not because I could sort of, Whenever I went on trial anywhere, I stood at the back. I always, I always had self, self-belief, but I never had confidence. Mm. So I always believed in my own ability. I always believed I was as good as everybody else, but I never had the confidence to push myself forward for mm. that reason because I was conditioned to think that way. Mm. Um, but as soon as I realized that I could change that, I changed it and everything changed for me. Off, off the pitch, on the pitch. Um, like you say, about three promotions with Doncaster, uh, five seasons in the championship. I had opportunities to leave, but decided not to, um, all based around me changing my thinking to get a different result. Massive, mate. Um, so, in terms of, I mean, I always like to ask this question, and it seems like you've kind of, you've realised that something needs to be done, and you've obviously acted on that, and it seems like you're doing a great thing. Um, but do you think more help's needed from whether it be external sources, we're, obviously we're aware of the PFA and they're, they're in the catch 22 situation where I, I do think they can do more, but they do a great job. Okay. Um, but do you think more can be done uh, from the PFA's perspective and maybe other organizations, whether it be clubs helping their players more? Again, we're just assets. So when you're a player, you're just an asset. Fine. No one really cares once you've left because you've moved on and you've 
no one cares about what you're doing when you've left the club, really. Um, but I think more help's needed, more awareness, uh, especially. Something like what you're doing is great. So obviously that's going to be integral going forward uh, for the future generations. But I still think more needs to be done, um, whether it be at academy level before that or kind of helping players laterally when it comes to the end of their careers and obviously retirement and considering those options. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. No, I agree. I think um, especially at academy level and I, I, I feel like players recycle back into football um, been paid a decent enough a wage uh, to justify being, being at that football club. I, I see a lot of players doing their own thing, one-to-one -one coaching, coaching soccer schools, um, because football clubs, they can't get the wages at the football clubs. And it's, it's, it's such a shame because the, the players are missing out, the young players are missing out on the coaching, the experience. Um, and in my opinion, the players are missing out with that connection back with with football giving them something after potentially 10 15 20 year careers mm. um, I think I think it's huge I think not just that I think within football clubs I think there's certain individuals that have played football that would be really good at different levels um, technical directors uh, I see it all the time um, friends at, at Red Bulls New York Red Bulls and sort of speaking to him at what they do and what lengths they go to to help their manager. But they've got people that know football within that framework. Mm. And I think things like that, I think recycling players back into the, to the football industry could only benefit the football um, the football industry as, as a whole. I think the national team, I think um, clubs in general. Um, mm. So I, I genuinely feel like that, that should, should, like more should be done. And I think... I know like what you're saying with the PFA, they are doing a lot and they are more active now um, because things are more accessible. Um, but I think it's how you communicate it as well. I think we spoke about it. But I, I feel like it's not as easy as just putting something out there and hoping people come and mm. like jump on board. I feel like you need to go to people. Yeah. Um, there's, not, there's not a great deal of professional footballers if, if, if you look at it. Um, and to, to get somebody to come to you once you've retired or you're looking to come out of football and say, look, he's your option. Not you come to us, we're going to you. This is part of what we offer. We come to you. What do you want to do? How are you doing? And you have that, like I'm saying about a mentorship program, you have that. Um, and, and that could be that could be ex-players doing that. Um, but I genuinely feel like that will progress. I don't think there's, I don't think it can't, to be honest. Mm. There's so many players out there, and as you mentioned there, although there's kind of so many leagues within the UK, in terms of kind of uh, the national kind of, uh, I don't know, the, the national head, if that makes sense, in terms of the amount yeah. of people living in the UK, football is a, is a minute piece of that. Um, so there's so many players out there that are coming to the end of their careers and are kind of thinking, well, what next? And if they were integrated into... I don't know, the PFA um, kind of uh, system or some other organisation whereby they could draw on their own experiences and go out and speak to clubs and say, look, this is what we're offering. This is what I did when I was a player, the highs and lows, the pitfalls to kind of avoid. Naturally, as a player, you're going to draw on uh, or you're going to be more kind of susceptible to listen to someone, more relatable, someone who's actually played the game. Um, and you can actually say, look, well, it's relatable because they've done it, they've lived it, they've breathed it, regardless of what level they played at, and now they're telling me about it, rather than maybe some external source who still may have the same information and, and harbour those thoughts, but the delivery may be slightly different. And as players, you know what it's like, it's about trust invariably. Um, everyone's trying to say something as a player, but... Again, when I, I was drawn, when the PFA used to come in and speak to us, probably at the start of the season at most of the clubs that I was at, and it was kind of, okay, well, we've seen you, and we probably won't see you again. Um, and most of the times when they came in, it was always about, well, okay, well, maybe you may not make it. There's a small percentage of you going to make it, especially as a carry player, we used to hear this quite a lot. And you don't really want to be hearing that. You're starting out in a new, new career, new environment, you're probably living away from home in digs and stuff, so all of that's hard to contend with anyway. But then have someone come in and tell you you may not make it when you've potentially got Bobby Robson or I have Martin O'Neill saying 
not not the next best thing, but you're probably going to be training with the reserves or the first team shortly. Who are you going to listen to? So it needs to be, the delivery, again, needs to be right. Um, and I'm sure you've obviously um, discussed that with your team with regards to the, the pro mindset program that you're putting forward. It's the biggest thing. And like you touched on it there, I think from a player's perspective, if you've been in the environment, you know, you know how players react to certain circumstances so you you're already um you've already got an advantage in terms of going into a room of 15 players knowing how to to come across i've been in so many meetings where we've had a psychologist or we've had somebody come in try to sell something or we've had somebody come in to try and work with the team and they just fell flat on their face because they've gone one way or the other um whereas i feel like if it's communicated in the right way, like you said at the beginning, or about people learning different ways, the majority of footballers that I've come across learn by doing and seeing, not yeah. by writing or sitting in a room for 45 minutes listening to somebody talk. Um, so by, by building that sort of rapport and finding out how players want to do certain things, offering it to them, showing them videos, showing them examples, making them yeah. do certain things, um, you're going to get a better engagement and they're going to want to feel like they're getting something out of it rather than sit in a room after they've played football thinking the last thing I want to be doing is sat here. Um, so I feel like as a player, you already have a head start with, with communicating it in the right way. And I think sometimes it's a positive, but it's a negative as well because certain people will look at it that you haven't got the qualifications, you haven't got this, you haven't done that. Um, and I think the ideal scenario would be to marry the two, would would be maybe come out of football, been put through the qualifications that you need, and then it'd be a win-win for, for the PFA, say, because it ticks all the boxes. Mm. Um, but like you said, time will tell. I think things are slowly changing. Um, and it, it, it's exciting. It's exciting for me anyway. I, I, I look at it like that. Um, I've been preparing for this, like I said, for five years. And if you look at it in that way, then you've got a better chance of, I, th I think, being successful outside of football. 100%. And again, um, I always like to say, look, it's fine saying more help's needed and whatever else. Brilliant. But as a player, as a person, you need to have that gumption to go out and get that help yourself. Go and network. Use your network as a player. And you don't realise, I, I never utilised my network when I was you don't realise how big your network is. Even within the club, you've got finance team, you've got HR, you've got this and that, all on your doorstep. But I never really used to speak to them unless I needed something. Mm -hmm. And that was it. It was never to pick their brains and find out what they were doing on a daily basis just because I was solely focused on playing. Um, I'm not yeah. saying that's a good thing. Um, I'd probably say it's not. Uh, again, um, But we can always sit here and kind of, it's not all doom and gloom as a player, Retirement, you retire what 35, 36, probably longer, um, and on obviously what you want to do, and then you've got the rest of your life to live, so it shouldn't be seen as a negative. Um, in terms of because obviously you mentioned there about obviously many different things in terms of the mindset and things going forward that can aid players, and you think it's moving in the right direction, albeit maybe quite slowly. Um, Going forward, um, in terms of what you're doing now, what have you taken from, say, football? What are your transferable skills? Um, I think there's so many. I think um, discipline, I think, is huge. I think having to be uh, at training a certain time, eating a certain um, certain thing to stay, to stay fit and healthy, um, been able to lead, been able to influence others, been able to organise um, all these things that, that people take for granted and doing these for the past 20 years. It's not something that I've done for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, being captain, it comes a huge responsibility. You have to lead by example. So having to produce every single day in training, um, raise the standards every single day, um, push people in the right way, communicate in the right way, get the best out of people, um, communicate with managers, communicate with fans, communicate with, with players. Um, there's so many different aspects of, of playing football. Sacrifice, sacrificing 
so many different things along the way um, yeah. in terms of there's a birthday, an anniversary, a christening, uh, the lads are going out, whatever it is, and, <laughs> and just being able to be strong-willed and yeah. um, say, no, I'm not going to do that because it's, it's not going to help me the next day, the next Saturday, the next Tuesday, whatever it is. Um, but again, all these things are taken for granted because that's what's expected of you. And you made a great point that while you're playing football, you have a little bit of an, not an ego, but you have um, a personality. You are a player. As soon as you lose that, as soon as you become a normal person, um, then that's when you start looking at the people that you should have gone to. But while you're a player, you're a player. You're almost put on a pedestal. You're almost this person that everybody looks up to. And, um, yeah. and, it, and I think that's what people struggle with is you lose that part of your personality, that, that part that you've had for 10, 15 years, however long it is. And nobody calls you James, Danny, the player. It's, mm. it's James, the normal person that everybody has to relate to or is relating to, the yeah. ex-player. Um, yeah. And I think when that happens, you have to make different, be forced into making different decisions, different, you put in different uh, environments, you put in different um, circles and you then become somebody totally different. But at the same time, you aren't. Do you know what I mean? You still have them skills. You still have them things that you had um, all that time. Mm. So, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, I mean, I resonate with what you're saying there. And I've always said before, kind of on previous shows, and just speaking to people in general, I always saw myself as me first and the football second, regardless of what anyone else said. Um, naturally, people, again, they're always going to have a perception of you. And if they want to see you as uh, a footballer first and then kind of James Coffin to second, that's kind of up to them. Um, but so many players, current and former players or athletes in general, they're they're kind of in that bubble. Uh, they're still kind of trying to hang on to that identity. And you hear many people say, oh, I've retired and I feel like I've lost my identity, which is yeah. it's hard to hear. Um, and it's, it's that element that may, may hinder you finding um, the transition away from what you're doing into a new career. Um, because, again, if you're trying to hold on, um, I'm not saying this is you, because obviously you've had a sustained career and you're still playing to a high level uh, and playing well at that. But so many players are playing 39, 40, 41, and they're not necessarily playing well, and they're not yeah. enjoying it, and they're just hanging on because they don't want to step away from the game or whatever they're actually doing in terms of being a sports person. Um, I always think, and I, I'm going to ask you the question, so as you know, when we were younger, we were kind of in the youth team and going through the academy system. I used to go to college once a day, and um, I never really had to go just because I was at a certain level in terms of playing. That they told me the coach said, Look, you don't need to go, you come and train with the reserves or whatever. Brilliant. And then I'd always ask the question, kind of, to the players that went to college, What was it like? What, what do you do today? Oh, I just messed around. So for me, it's just a wasted day, like it's just a day off for them. Um, so they're not really going there with any intentions and learning anything. Granted, this wasn't all the players, but I'd probably say 80% of them had this kind of thought. Um, now, if they offered players even then and, and more so now, work experience as we mentioned earlier players like to feel and touch things they want it to be tangible rather than maybe just sitting and, and listening to someone talk for an hour they want to touch and feel it so what about if they went and worked in an office say in an estate agent or in a warehouse or something something that they maybe chose so the choice was theirs but even if they didn't have an interest to maybe doing that when they when it comes to the end of their career it gives them an opportunity to go and work in maybe a nine to five or do an afternoon somewhere, completely away from the football fraternity, gives them an insight into what life is like on the other side. And even if they didn't like it, it's probably going to make them work slightly harder to make the football. So from a club's perspective, it's a win-win. It wouldn't cost them anything. The companies would welcome them because if you, if you say, okay, well, we're an estate agent and we've got James Coppinger coming in once a week working for us, that's a great selling point. Most people like football. Most people like any type of sport, really. So straight away, it's a talking point. Now, for me as a player, if I was in that environment and given the opportunity, I would welcome that. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, whether you would be the same, whether you'd take that on board as a player or not. I think it's an amazing idea. I think I did leisure and tourism. 
<laughs> everyone, everyone did that. <laughs> yeah, so for me, like doing leisure and tourism at 17 was like, what, what is going on? Like, yeah. like you said, it wasn't even messing about. It was, we sat down, the tutor came in, he told us, basically wrote down what we should do. We just copied it. And it was like, yeah. it, was, it was a waste of time. It was a waste of one day a week for two years. Um, mm. So I think it's an unbelievable idea. I think, I think when I did works experience at school, I really sort of got something out of it for a week. Um, and I think for something like that, to go on exactly what you're saying is it's a life skill it's it's you're learning something different you're in a different environment if you put in the right sort of placement and people understand what 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 we're trying to get out of it then it could be huge for people Mm. and 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 again it it could give them that motivation to work harder because it's like i don't want to be getting up at nine and finishing at five or i don't want to be doing this or i don't want to be doing that well if you don't want to be doing it then do this a little bit harder and work a little bit harder doing this and make make a bit more of an effort doing that. Mm. Um, so I think it's a great idea. I think I think it would really help the young players understand a little bit more about what's next. Mm, definitely. Um, and even the older players, I mean, as you know, you normally finish training at one um, and then you're home at half one or whatever, depending on where you're living. Um, invariably, you get Wednesdays off. So that's an opportunity where you could maybe use that time to go and get some work experience even as as a kind of senior player as well um so it's just something i've been thinking about kind of for the last month or so um and again i don't know whether that's going to be kind of something that would come into fruition going forward i really don't know but it's just an idea i think is quite progressive uh may have some legs in it um i think i think sorry i i think there danny i think depending at what level i think um and that's where I was going to go with everything. Like, I think the Premier League are way out in terms of... Yeah. It's, you, could, you could sign a five-year contract in the Premier League and be made for life to an extent. You could have yeah. enough money to support yourself. If you sign a five-year contract in the Premier League, then you're going to work your way down um, invariably and pick yeah. up wages as well, which, which we've probably both seen. Um, mm-hmm. So you're talking League Twos, League Ones, Championship have, have still got a really a lot of money in there, and yeah. it, it's sort of you can still sort of define a, a really good or make a really good career out of it if you mm-hmm. if you have sort of 10, 15 years in the Championship. So I think you're looking at sort of Leagues Two and Leagues One where that could make a huge difference. You know, yeah. where people maybe want to have the opportunity to to get to them leagues and make that career and, and earn that money. Yeah. Um, whereas if they don't, then they have something to fall back onto, or it's almost explained to them in a way yeah. in which they understand a little bit more about it. It's actually yeah. they're aware of it. Mm. Yeah, you make a good point, and that's uh, 100% true. I, I agree with what you just mentioned there. Um, leading to a close, um, obviously, we've, we've spoken about your company, Pro Mindset, and I think you said you buy companies as well. So just uh, it's an opportunity for you to sell yourself and just let everyone know. Um, obviously, uh, the name of the company, where we can find you, what you actually do, and obviously, just touch on you mentioned you sell and um, sorry, you buy companies. So, just touch on that a little bit as well, please. Yeah, so we formed uh, me and my business partner, Sean Devine, who I played with at Exeter um, probably 16, 17 years ago. Sean's a little bit older than me. Mm. Uh, we formed a company called the Zenic Group, um, an acquisitions company, buying companies all over the UK. Um, and yeah, basically making it easier for uh, business owners to exit their companies. Um, a lot of a lot of businesses that we buy, sort of business owners come to the end um, to retirement age, and they've basically had enough. Um, they're either tired, worn out, and they just don't know how to exit their business. Right. So we formed a company, making it easier for them to get out. Um, really transparent um and it's really exciting because for me and sean like what you said there sort of transferring our skills into into the boardroom into business meetings into um a totally different environment but with the same skills 100 percent um we've had to sort of meet and do vendor calls where there's me and sean talking to business owners that companies are earning four or five turn over four or five million a year and me and Sean have, have, have held our own and mm. um, 
it, it's huge. Like you say, being successful in football, gaining promotions, you have to you have to have something about you. You have to have good leadership skills. Um, and it's the same in business, exactly the same in business. And I feel like we both have that. Um, we offer, like you say, something um, totally different to everybody else. Yeah. But we have non-execs that have been business in business for 20, 30, 40 years. So we're learning from the best. We have huge... It's, it's like my mentorship programs uh, with Pro Mindset. It's like I have somebody who I can call upon at any point and ask questions and they can guide me. Um, and, it, and it's massive. Having somebody, I call it modeling excellence. Having somebody who's been there, seen it and done it is better than guessing and yeah. trying to, to have a big ego and say, I can do it by myself. Um, there's no point in doing that, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that's... Uh... That's a great point. Um, if you want to just let everyone know where we can find you on social media and, and LinkedIn and various other places. Yeah, so we're on LinkedIn um, and we've got a website, um, zenitgroup.co.uk. Um, and yeah, it's, it's like you say, it's, it's something totally different to what we're used to. Um, but we're meeting unbelievable people. And like you say, business owners are human beings like footballers are. And a lot of these companies, they've started um, 20, 30 years ago and they've built this, their companies up from nothing. And it's not always easy when you come to, to the point where you want to sell your business um, because you have an emotional attachment to it. And that's where we come in, I think. For us, it's about understanding the business owner, understanding what they want and trying to make it a win-win for both parties, I think. Um, transparency is huge in anything that you do. Um, in business, like in football, there's a lot of people that do it the wrong way, yeah. um, but we, we feel like we do it the right way um, and communicate in the right way. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really exciting and something that I'm really looking forward to do for the next 10, 20 years. Brilliant, mate. And in terms of yourself, where can we find you on the socials? Yeah, so it's the same, LinkedIn um, and Twitter, Instagram. Um, Pro Mindset's on Instagram now. Um, so again, I'm, I'm trying to create content for people to help people, to give people an insight into what a professional mindset looks like. Um, and I know it's not always what people want to see or hear. It, there's a, I feel like there's still a stigma attached to it. Um, yeah. people just get on with their lives and think they're fine, which, which a lot of people are. I'm not saying this is for everybody, mm. but I feel like if you want to better yourself, if you want to be more successful, if you want to improve what you're doing, then you have to understand a lot of that is down to how you think and you can change how you think to get a better result. A lot of people just saunter along and think things are going to change for them. Um, and I know for a fact that isn't the case. You have to change the way you do things and you have to change the way you think. Brilliant, mate. Really appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate your time. Uh, really enjoyed your, um, the insight you've got on kind of what you're actually doing. And obviously it's massive that you're still playing at the age of uh, 39. Um, so all I can do is wish you the best on and off the pitch, mate. I'm sure you'd be fine anyway. Um, but yeah, like I said, thank you for coming on. My pleasure, Danny. Um, nice to talk to you. Nice to catch up. And like I say, I wish you all the best as well. Brilliant, mate. Thank you. See you soon.